This is a quiz on factoring. We're factoring quadratic expressions, sum of two cubes, difference of two squares, um, even a little grouping. And uh, this is, uh, and also um, factoring out a common factor, all right, GCF. And, um, but the quiz also covers solving quadratic equations by these three methods, uh, solving using the quadratic formula, solving by factoring, and solving by completing the square. Okay. Number one, if we want to uh, if we want to factor completely, let me zoom in. The first thing we do is check to see if there's a common factor. I don't see anything that divides into all three of these. Um, when I have a trinomial like this, a three-piece, it usually factors as a binomial times a binomial. I start by looking at the 3x squared. And I ask myself, what times what makes 3x squared? Well, that can only be 3x times x. Then I look at the 45. And I ask myself, what times what makes 45? The first thing that pops into my head is um, 5 times 9. All right, because 5 times 9 is 45. Um, I also know that this is 3 times 15, and then there's all, always 1 times 45. But I'm really hoping the 5 and the 9 will, will do it for me. Um, the order matters, so I, I normally I just uh, start off with a smaller one, just as a habit. So I'll do 5 times 9. Um, but I want to point something out to you. In this particular case, I would never try 9 and 5 in this order because there will never be a common factor inside the parentheses if there wasn't a common factor in the original problem. So since there was no GCF to start off with, um, and uh, if I put a 9 here, they're both divisible by 3. That will not turn out to be the answer, so why waste your time? Okay, so I could save time by sticking to 5 and 9 in that order. Now, I need to, um, the key is that the inner plus the outer has to equal the middle. Right now, inner, I have 5x. Outer, I have 27x, 3 times 9. So 27x. That has to equal the middle of uh, 22x positive 22. Okay, um, let's see, so can I pick the signs properly so I get a positive 22? Yeah, if I make this a positive 27 and I make this a negative 5, that will be 22. So there's my negative 5 and this would cause a positive 27. I have to check one last thing. Does negative 5 times positive 9 equal negative 45? Yes. That means this is the answer. So uh, I would put this on my answer line, and I will do that later. All right, for now, let's move on down to number 2. The first step of factoring is to look for a common factor. Um, I notice that both of these are divisible by 3. That is the GCF, so I will pull out the 3 outside of parentheses. Now, whenever I pull out a common factor, what I really am doing is I'm dividing to see what goes inside. So 12 divided by 3 is 4, so this will be 4x squared minus 9. All right, 27 divided by 3 is 9. But then I notice that this is the difference of two squares. So uh, this can be factored further. So I'll take that 3 and keep it, but then I'll continue. The difference of two squares is the one where this will factor as 2x plus 3, 2x minus 3. Okay, 1 plus 1 minus, you split these right down the middle, 2 times 2, 3 times 3. And that's it. This is the final answer for number 2. Now, when I look at number three, I notice that these, uh, this is the sum of, well, the difference of two perfect cubes. 216, I know, is 6 to the third power. 
Um, when you guys took this quiz, I encouraged you to make a list of the first 10 perfect cubes down the side of your paper. So if you did that, you came up with a list like this, and you see the 216 right there, and it comes from 6. Um, now, there's a pattern that you had to basically memorize as far as the way you factor the sum or difference of two perfect cubes. And that is that when you factor it, it's, um, it's always going to factor as a binomial times a trinomial, a two-piece times a three-piece. All right, the binomial is the most important part, but it's really easy. It's just going to be the root of each one of these things. n to the third power comes from taking n and cubing it. I just bring down the minus sign. 216 came from taking 6 and cubing it. p to the third power came from taking p and cubing it. So basically, uh, this binomial comes from taking the cube root of uh, each of the original terms. So we've got the binomial. All right, now the three terms of the trinomial will come from the binomial. Um, I like to start with the beginning and end of the trinomial um, because, you know, the trinomial is going to have three pieces to it. So that's why they call it a trinomial. Um, it's going to have, be have a beginning, an end, and a middle. Okay, now the beginning and end come directly from the, uh, the two terms of the binomial. And uh, you square these terms. So looking at the binomial, if I square this, I get the first term. So that'll just be n squared. If I square this, I'll get the last term. 6 times 6 is 36, so I'll have plus 36p squared because of p times p. Square everything. This will always be positive because even if you square a negative number, a negative times a negative is a positive. All right, so we got the beginning and end by squaring these two terms. Um, we're going to get the middle by multiplying. Now we're still dealing with these two terms, so we're talking about n and negative 6p. Okay, if we multiply these together, we would get negative 6np. Um, and we're going to use that except for we're going to do the opposite sign. So that since this is negative 6np, we will do positive 6np. Okay, so the middle term, you just multiply these two terms and uh, you change the sign. Okay, it helps some students to think of this as soap. Alright, this is to help you remember how the signs work. Same, uh, this stands for same, opposite, always positive. Same because these signs are always the same. Opposite because these signs are always opposite. And then always positive because this is always positive. So that's the answer. All right, move on to number four. The first step of factoring is to look for a common factor. I see that both of these are divisible by three, and I see that they both have an n. So that's uh, three n is the greatest common factor. So I'll bring that out of parentheses. Again, when you factor out a common factor, what you really do is you divide by it. And that tells you what goes on the inside. So 21 divided by 3 is 7. n to the third power divided by n is n squared. All right, the bottom n cancels out one of these three n's and leaves 2. Um, 18 divided by 3 is 6. And then these n's cancel out completely. So, so far we have this. Then we look on the inside and see if we can factor this further. Um, well, this is nothing special. Um, we don't have the sum of cubes. We don't have the difference of two squares. This cannot be factored any further. So that means that's the final answer. All right, so we move on to number five. The first step of factoring is to look and see, is there a common factor? 
Well, there is. Um, all of these are divisible by 2. So you should pull out that common factor of 2 before you do anything else. So that's going to leave behind x squared minus 8x plus 15. Okay, again, because when you pull out a common factor, you divide. Okay, brat. But uh, this trinomial will surely factor further. So we'll keep this 2, and we'll factor some more. So x squared is x times x. 15, well, okay, pause. Um, 15 is either going to be 3 times 5, or 1 times 15. Um, looking at the 8, I'm thinking 3 times 5. Okay, I'm, in my mind I'm picturing an inner of 3x, an outer of 5x, and a need for a negative 8 middle, um, which I would get if these were both negative. Alright, that would make negative 8. So that means these would both have to be negative. And a negative times a negative is a positive, so it even gives me the positive 15. So that means, boom, this is the answer. Right there. Okay, let's go on to number six. Well, the first step of factoring is to look and see, is there a common factor? And this does have a common factor. It has a common factor of three. So your first move is to pull out the 3. So that's going to leave x squared plus 8. Again, I'm dividing by 3. OK. Um, can I factor this further? Well, it's a binomial, all right? The only, there's only uh, two ways so far that we know how to factor a binomial. Uh, and that's um, if it's the difference of two squares. Well, it's not subtraction, and that's not a perfect square. Or if it's the sum of two cubes. Well, um, that, wait, I messed up. Sorry to say that's not a cube, but um, it is a cube. Ha uh ha. -huh. Let me fix that. Sum of two cubes, right. Uh, we canceled out the threes, but the x to the third power shouldn't be changing. So this is the sum of two cubes. Remember that list you should have written down the side of your paper? Um, 8 comes from 2 to the third power, so 8 is a perfect cube. That means this can be factored further. Okay, so the way we factor the sum of two cubes is it's always going to factor as a binomial and a trinomial. The binomial is just the root, the cube root of each of these, so x plus 2. Okay, remember that the 8 came from a 2. Alright, that's why 2. Um, the trinomial, alright, it's going to have this beginning, middle, and end. Alright, and uh, the beginning and end just come from squaring these two terms. Alright, if I square x, that's just x squared. If I square 2, that's 4. The middle comes from multiplying these two terms together. Um, wait, this is always positive. Put a plus. If I do uh, x times 2, well, that's just 2x. And we always do the opposite sign. All right, again, some students find it helpful to think so soap. Where did the b come from? Same, opposite, always positive. These signs are the same, and then these signs are opposite, and then this sign is always positive. So same, opposite, always positive. Anyway, that's the answer. Let's look at number seven. Alrighty then. Um, four terms. I taught you to think grouping when you see four terms like this. Um, so grouping involves uh, looking at this pair as a w one problem and sort of looking at this pair as a second group, all right, like its own little problem. 
So looking at this first uh, pair, I'm looking for the greatest common factor. Well, these are both divisible by 2, and they both have at least 1n. So the common factor is 2n. So I will pull that 2n outside of parentheses. Okay, now inside the parentheses, you know, if I divide by 2n, all right, the 2's cancel, and I get just n minus, all right, 10 uh, divided by 2 is 5. So n minus 5 is what I have on the inside here. Okay, now looking at these, common factor, I see the 3 divides in, and both have a p, so that's 3p is my common factor, greatest common factor. Okay, now if I divide everything by 3p, the 3's cancel and the p's cancel, so that just leaves n. Alright, bring down that minus. 15 divided by 3 is 5, and the p's cancel. So I got n minus 5 again. That's really necessary for the grouping method. These, uh, we need a common factor in the parentheses. It has to be the same parentheses. Because this is the same, I can factor it out. All right, just like I factor out any GCF, the red here is itself a common factor that can be pulled away and put out front. Okay. So if I factor out a common factor of n minus 5, pull that away, like if I were to erase these and put them here, you can see that that would leave behind the blue stuff, which is 2n plus 3p. So this would be the answer for number 7. Okay, let's look at number 8. Okay, now we're moving into the solve problems. Now, notice that none of these problems had equal signs. They're just expressions, they're not equations. That's why we were not solving them. It would be incorrect to say that this is a solution. All right, uh, this is just a different form of the original problem. So we factored and we stopped because that's all you can do when it's not an equation. And that's why the directions themselves just say factor completely. They don't say anything about solving. Solving is what you do when you're finding the value of the variable. Like this, this uh, equation has x's in it. So if I solve this, in the end, I'll be able to tell you what x equals. All right. Um, so we will solve this using the quadratic formula you need to know what the quadratic formula is of course um, the, quadra the quadratic formula says that if we have something in the form um, let's see I feel like doing this in the pink no I'll do this purple sort of a raspberry um, if I have an equation in, in this form ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. All right, standard form quadratic equation. Then the solution, or solutions, I should say, will be opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. All right, that's the quadratic formula. That's how you find the solutions. All right, notice how I always say opposite of b. I don't say negative b. I say opposite of b. All right, and there was a song that went with it. Opposite of b, opposite of b, plus or minus square root, plus or minus square root, b squared minus 4ac, b squared minus 4ac, all over 2a, all over 2a. All right, if you have trouble remembering the quadratic formula, you should practice that song, play it back a couple times, and master it. Anyway, um, so to solve this problem using the quadratic formula, it needs to be in standard form like this. So that means the 6x needs to be over where it belongs. So 
that's why we will subtract 6x from both sides. And then we will get 3x squared minus 6x minus 1 is equal to 0. So I see my a, my b, and my c. Okay, um, so you know what, maybe I should just say it. So a is 3, b is negative 6, and c is negative 1. All right, so that stuff is going to wind up plugged into the quadratic formula. However, um, I told you that what you should do is find the discriminant first. Now the discriminant is the b squared minus 4ac part that's underneath the radical. All right, uh, so you should always find that first. Okay, so the discriminant, maybe I'll write it out for once. Discriminant. The discriminant is b squared minus 4ac. You should always find that first. So for this problem, the discriminant is going to be negative 6 squared minus 4 times 3 times negative 1. That's b squared minus 4ac. Now, um, you can use your calculator to help you out, especially if you're prone to mistakes. All right, now when I put this in my calculator, I like to square this in my head. Negative 6 squared is 36. You know, you square something, it's always going to be positive. All right, do not type negative 6 squared in your calculator. Um, common mistake kids will do is they will type negative 6 squared like this. But that would give you negative 36, which is wrong. So common mistake, some kids will type negative 6 squared minus 4, you know, times 3 times negative 1 okay and they'll get negative 24 but again this is wrong alright so if you really do 36 you know which is positive um, minus 4 times 3 times negative 1 you get 48 that's the correct discriminant alright so the discriminant is 48 you should have that before you do anything else so when you go to find the solution, okay, which I'm going to do over here, um, we do opposite of b, all right? Again, here's a little peek at the quadratic formula. So opposite of b plus or minus. So b was negative 6, so um, opposite of b is going to be positive 6 plus or minus the square root. Now under here goes the discriminant, which we just calculated separately as 48. And then it's all over 2a. Well, a is 3, so 2a would be 6. All right, so this is the uh, solution, um, but we just need to simplify it as much as possible. So um, the first thing to do to simplify this, by the way, do not type this whole thing in your calculator. That's um, Your calculator doesn't handle this very well just type in the square root of 48 that's the only thing I want you to put in your calculator so if I do the square root of 48 right now I get 4 radical 3 so on your paper this becomes 6 plus or minus 4 radical 3 over 6 okay now if all three of these things um, have a common factor you should divide by it so I heard that there's another teacher out there who um, has uh, her students draw a heart around these three things. Okay, and within that heart, you look for your common factor. And I like that. I think I'm going to do that from now on. Thanks, Kelsey, for passing that on. Um, all of these can be divided by 2. So within the heart here, we're going to divide all of these things by 2. You, you don't do anything with the, uh, the radical. Okay, and it has to be all or nothing. If this 4 weren't here, there's nothing I could, I couldn't uh, cancel out the 6's or anything like that. Alright, it's all 3 or nothing. So this is going to become, alright, now remember, I'm dividing all 3 of these by 2. 
So this is going to become 3 plus or minus 2 radical 3 over 3. Okay, and that is the best that you can do. Is there an answer line? You will actually write it this time. So 3 plus or minus 2 radical 3 over 3. That's what should have been uh, on your answer line, just like that. Okay, let us move on, my friends. Now we will solve by factoring. We will do um, the same type of thing we did on the front page, all this good factoring we did. But to solve, we will just go a step further than this. OK, um, but for starters, we need it to be in standard form. Remember, uh, just like the quadratic formula, where we have ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0, standard form. Uh, we need this to be in standard form to factor as well. So this 12x needs to be on the left side, as does the 3. So what I will do then is I will subtract 12x from both sides. OK, so that is going to give me 8x squared plus 7x. Whoa, messed up. Start over. These are like terms, so I'm going to actually do 7 minus 12, 7x minus 12x. Alright, so that's going to be negative 5x equals 3. Alright, so so far those canceled out, and uh, these two together made negative 5. But like I said, the 3 has to go as well. So I'm also going to subtract 3 from both sides. Now these are not like terms. This has an x, this doesn't. So I'm not going to get 2x or anything like that. I am just going to write my 8x squared minus 5x, and then I'll just stick the 3 next to it, minus 3 like that, equals 0. These were gone. All right, now it's in standard form. Now I can factor. There is no GCF. Um, so I can go ahead and do my thing. All right, this trinomial is, um, if it's going to factor, it'll be a binomial times a binomial. So I'm looking at that 8. First thing that pops into my head is 2 times 4. And in fact, there are only two options. See, they're going to be 2 times 4 or 1 times 8. That's it. Of course, the 3 can only be 1 times 3. So let's start with the 2 times 4 and see if that works out. So um, 8x squared could be 2x and 4x. 3 is going to be 1 times 3. Um, the order matters, so it could either be 1 and 3, or if this doesn't work out, I'll go 3 and 1. But I'll, I'll start off this way. Now the key is that the inner plus the outer has to equal the middle. All right, when I say the middle, I'm talking about this negative 5x up there. So inner, I have 4x. Outer, I'm multiplying here, uh, that's going to be 6x. All right, I'm trying to get negative 5 out of it. All I can control are the signs. Um, there's no way to get negative 5 out of 4 and 6. So that didn't work out. Um, before I throw out the 1 and 3, well, I guess technically it's the 2 and 4 I'd be throwing out, um, I will try reversing the direction. Maybe instead of 1 and 3, it'll be 3 and 1. So inner, I've got 12. 3 times 4 is 12, so I've got 12x. Outer, I've got 2. Okay, it's 2x. And again, I'm trying to get negative 5. Um, I can't. There's no way to get negative 5 out of 12 and 2. All right, so that means the 2 times 4 option did not work for, for me today. So um, I'm going to start over. OK, so that didn't work. So instead of 2 times 4, um, I'm going to go with the 1 and 8. So in other words, x and 8x. Okay, 
So now I'm going to do the 1 and 3 again. So 1 times 3. If I do this, inner, I have 8x. Outer, I have 3x. All right, again, I'm trying to get this the middle. Inner plus outer has to equal the middle, negative 5. Um, can I get negative 5 out of uh, 8 and 3? I can, can't I? Um, if this were a negative 8 and this were a positive 3, that would make negative 5. OK, let's see. Um, if I make this negative 1, that will cause the inner to be negative 8. And if I make this positive 3, then there's my positive 3x. Also, negative 1 times positive 3 is negative 3. So that means I factored it correctly. All right, so that was a pretty difficult factoring problem, but we did it. Now, um, we keep going because it's not just a factoring problem. We're supposed to solve, which means we need to get all the way down to x equals something. So what I do is, um, and I like to sort of make a line, all right? And I've got x minus 1 equals 0. I set each one of these factors equal to 0, and I solve. Solving this is pretty quick, because that would give me x equals 1. OK, so that's one of my solutions. Over here, I need to subtract 3 from both sides. so. That's going to give me 8x equals negative 3. OK, if I then divide by 8, that is going to give me um, x equals negative 3 over 8, which is another solution. OK, did they leave me space down here? Um, yeah, so x equals 1 or negative 3 over 8. So there you go. That's how you solve by factoring. Last but not least, we shall solve by completing the square. Completing the square involves having a, a special number right here. Um, and 25 is not it. So we need to get the 25 out of there. So we will do that by simply subtracting 25 from both sides. So that leaves me with x squared minus 8x, we'll leave a space, is equal to negative 25. So now we ask ourselves, what is that magical number that completes the square? And we find it by doing half of the middle squared. So half of this number is negative 4. If I square that, I get positive 16. This will always be positive. Um, now, I've, I've added 16 on the left-hand side, unbalancing the equation. So I must balance the equation by also adding 16 on the right-hand side. OK. Um, now we factor. So on the left-hand side, part of the reason why uh, we completed the square was um, that procedure, putting a 16 here, guarantees that this will factor as the same thing twice. So this is going to be x times x. And since it has to be the same thing twice, I know that's just going to be 4 times 4. All right, I see this minus here, so that will only happen if I have a negative 4 and another negative 4 to get negative 8. So boom, that's how you factor it. Putting these together, um, that looks like negative 9. OK, now the benefit of having the same thing twice is because then we can write this as x minus 4 squared is equal to negative 9. All right, now that we have this, to solve it, we can take the square root of both sides. When you take the square root of both sides of an equation, your solution 
will be either positive or negative. So really you get two solutions out of it. Now the square root and the exponent of 2 are their inverses, so they cancel each other out. So we're just going to be left with x minus 4, all right, once these cancel each other out, is equal to. Now, be careful. You see this not this negative under the radical. If you try, try to do the square root of 9 in your calculator, well, let's see. Square root of negative 9. Oh, domain error. Eh, eh, warning, warning. Okay, you can't take the square root of a negative number. So what I taught you to do was take that negative outside and uh, write it as an I. I stands for imaginary, because if you think you're going to have a solution to the square root of negative 9, um, you must be dreaming, all right? It's, it can only be imaginary. Um, now, once that negative comes out as an I, then you can go ahead and take the square root of 9. Okay, uh, the square root of 9 is 3, correct? All right, just a plain old ordinary 3. So when you rewrite this, okay, um, now instead of writing I3, we put 3I, all right? The I goes on the right if it's a number, and on the left if it's a radical. So we write plus or minus 3I. Now we're trying to solve for x, so that means we still need to get x by itself. So we will add 4 to both sides. Now when you add to this side, when you have a plus or minus involved, you need to be careful to put uh, the added number in the very front. So this is going to become x equals 4 plus or minus 3i. And that's the answer. 4 plus or minus 3i. All right, let's move on to the bonus. See what trouble we can get into. OK, um, Helen solved the following problem by completing the square, like we just looked at. She made a critical error. Find her error and then solve the problem correctly using the same method of completing the square. Okay? So, let's find her error. Um, probably the easiest way to find her error is to um, start solving the problem yourself and see what you do differently. Okay? Um, now, if we were solving this problem, let me recopy it. So we have 5x squared minus 10x plus 9. See how much paper do we have over here? It's a lot of paper. Okay. Um, so we had 5x squared minus 10x uh, plus 9 equals 0. Okay. If we were going to solve this by completing the square, um, the first thing we would do is get rid of that 9. All right, I've got to move that away. So we would subtract 9 from both sides. So that would give us 5x squared minus 10x, leave a space, is equal to negative 9. All right, let's see, did they do that? OK, 5x squared minus 10x equals negative 9. So far, we're in agreement. OK, now, a common mistake would be to do half of the middle squared right now. If I try to do half of the middle squared right now, half of 10 is 5, 5 squared is 25, so then I'd be putting a 25 right here. Okay, um, but we're not going to do that. Because it doesn't work when uh, the leading coefficient is uh, not 1. So we're going to avoid that common mistake by uh, factoring out this leading coefficient of 5. So if I factor out the 5, okay, that leaves x squared minus 2x, I'm still leaving my space, equals negative 9. All right, so instead of um, having a 25 here, like we would have, half of 2 is 1. 
one squared is one. So we will actually add a one right here. All right, then we have to be careful what we put over here because a second common mistake is that even if kids got this far and figured out that it's a one, not a 25, then kids will think I'm gonna add a one over here on the right hand side to balance it out. They're not realizing that this is not really a one um, because of this five out front. Imagine doing the distributive property. All right, this one is inside of parentheses it's going to immediately get multiplied by 5. 5 times 1 is 5. So the real value of this change is it has a value of 5, 5 times 1. So to balance it out, I really need to add 5 over here. Okay, so let's glance over and see, are they adding 1 on the left? Are they adding 5 on the right? Did they factor out the 5? Oh, they made the first common mistake of just taking half of the middle squared now. Okay, so um, here's the error, and we will just say they, or okay, this is Helen, so we should say she did not, well, she did not factor out the 5. Okay, like there should have been a 5 and stuff. Okay, um, maybe I'll leave it like that. Okay, she did not factor out the 5 first. All right, so that was her mistake. Um, now we will proceed to do it correctly and see what really is supposed to happen. So as we continue the problem, we will keep this five and we will go ahead and factor this. Um, meanwhile, this makes negative four. Now this should factor as the same thing twice. So that's gonna make x minus one times x minus one. Okay, um, if I take the square root no, I'm sorry. If um, Since these are the same thing twice, I can write x minus 1 squared is equal to negative 4. Before I take the square root, I need to divide by 5. Get that out of there. You can't take the square root right now. 5 is not a perfect square. So instead, you want to divide both sides by 5. That way these 5s will cancel out. So what you have left is x minus 1 squared is equal to negative 4 over 5. Okay, um, at that point, we could take the square root of both sides. Don't forget that the solution will be plus or minus. Now if we do that, um, these are going to cancel each other out. So we're going to have x minus 1 all right, all by itself is equal to plus or minus. Now, I told you if you have a negative under the radical, you should bring that out um, as an i. So it's i times the square root of 4 over 5. Okay, um, I'm going to leave it like this for now. Um, so then t uh, we want to get the x by itself so we could add 1 to both sides. Okay, so that would give me x equals 1 plus or minus i radical 4 over 5. Now look, I would have accepted this as an answer. All right, full credit. Um, there are some things you can do with this square root of 4 over 5, which I'll show you real quick, but um, for the record, I would have accepted this as an answer. Okay, um, with the square root of 4 over 5, This is the same thing as square root of 4 over the square root of 5. Okay? Uh, you know what? Maybe I should put this straight down. You know, I just, I'll keep going. Okay. Um, I'll do it like this. The square root of 4 is 2. 
So that would be 2 over the square root of 5. All right, so we could have done that. Um, just to be sure, because uh, um, technically you're not supposed to leave radicals in the denominator. Okay, so, um, but another form of the answer. So I, instead of having radical 4 over 5, I could have had 2 over radical 5, and that would have been swell. But um, look what happens if you put uh, 2 over, whoa, I forgot that was there. Um, if I put two, 2 over radical 5 in my calculator, I get 2 radical 5 over 5. Okay, so that's another thing I could have had. I could have had 2 radical 5 over 5. Okay, so instead of having this, I could have had 2 over radical 5 right here, or I could have had 2 radical 5 over 5 right here. All right, I would, I would accept either of those. So that is how you would properly solve this by completing the square. All right, that is it. Um, we're finished the quiz, and I hope you, you learned something. I'll see you on the next video.